Hi, this is Sherry Shabowski, and today we're going to be talking about the spleen. The functions of the spleen are basically all about the blood. It is the red cell graveyard. It is the largest lymph node. It is capable of autotransfusion in times of need. It can sequester platelets. It recycles iron. And it plays a big role in hematopoiesis, especially when the bone marrow is not functioning normally. The gross anatomy of the spleen is its location in the left upper quadrant. It is about the size of your fist, three inches by five inches, basically. The blood su supply comes from the aorta through the celiac trunk to the splenic artery. The venous return is by way of the splenic vein to the portal vein within the liver. The previous picture showed the spleen, the liver, and the vasculature without the other organs, but the spleen is adjacent to many organs. Superiorly, it is adjacent to the diaphragm. Laterally, it lies against the rib cage. The medial aspect is seen above. The spleen abuts the stomach, the colon, the pancreas, and the kidney. The gastrosplenic ligament and the splenorenal ligament hold it in place. It lives within the peritoneal cavity. It is covered in visceral peritoneum, except at the hilum, where the blood vessels enter. Here's a cross section of the spleen. It is divided into red pulp and white pulp. The red pulp handles the red cells. The red pulp has slitted sinusoids that the red cells need to slip through in order to move back into the circulation. It also stores red blood cells and platelets so in times of need they can be sent out into the circulation a sort of autotransfusion. It holds approximately a cup of red blood cells and platelets. The white pulp, seen in pink here, serves as the largest lymph node in the body. The one major difference is that the blood is what is flowing through the white pulp as opposed to the lymph that flows through the lymph nodes. This is the place where the adaptive immune system meets the blood. The spleen is the red cell graveyard. This is where extravascular hemolysis occurs. The sinusoids in the red pulp have slits where the red cells need to fold and slip through in order to go back into the circulation. Young red cells are able to slip through easily because they are distensible. Red blood cells typically live about 120 days. Every second, your body makes about 2 million red blood cells. It takes a red blood cell less than a minute to move from your heart, through your body, and back to the heart again. They are constantly squeezing through the capillaries, so they must be flexible and resilient in order to do their job. If they are old or damaged or they don't have the required distensibility, they will be destroyed as they try to get through the sinusoids in the spleen. This is called extravascular hemolysis. This ensures that the circulating red blood cells are healthy and able to carry oxygen effectively to your tissues. Only the flexible survive. Close up on the red pulp here, where the red cells move through the macrophage-loaded interstitium and then squeeze through the venous cord slits. If they are too old or not flexible, they can't slip through. They get broken up and the macrophages eat them. Here's the recycling program. So after the poor old red cells fail to squeeze through, 
They are gobbled up by macrophages stationed in the area. The hemoglobin within the red cells is broken down into its components, heme and globin. The heme is converted into biliverdin, which is then converted into bilirubin, which then goes into the circulation. The globin is broken down into its amino acids, which are recycled to be used in protein synthesis within the body. Let's talk a little more recycling. I bet you were wondering what happened to the iron. Well, iron attaches to transferrin. Transferrin, I love it when things are named for what they do. Transferrin carries iron through the blood vessels to the liver and bone marrow to be re reused in new red blood cells. As we saw in the last slide, heme is broken down by macrophages, transformed into biliverdin, and then transformed into unconjugated bilirubin, which travels through the bloodstream to the liver, where bilirubin is metabolized and conjugated and then excreted into the intestine. Overall, this is an excellent recycling program, which is critical since red cells only live 120 days, more or less, and you need approximately 20 to 30 trillion red cells circulating at any given time, each taking about 172,000 laps around the body before they recycle. Here's a closer look at the white pulp. It only accounts for about 25% of the spleen, but a lot happens here. This is where the blood meets the adaptive immune system. B and, T cells, B and T cell activation occurs here. The periarterial lymphatic sheath is composed of macrophages and T cells. The marginal zone contains macrophages and follicles. The follicles contain the naive B cells that need to be challenged by an antigen so they can then have something to attack. Up close and personal on the white pulp here, antigen presenting cells arriving at the spleen with a foreign antigen present it to T cells in the periarterial lymphatic sheath. Here you see it at number one. These cells then become activated. T cells then activate the B cells in the follicles, seen as number two. B cells become antibody-producing plasma cells, as you see in number three, either in, the red, either in the red pulp or the white pulp. The plasma cells can be located in either one. Antibodies leave the follicles to travel widely through the systemic circulation. I should really say antibodies leave the plasma cells to travel widely through the systemic circulation. That is correct. If a virus enters the spleen through the blood, follicle B cells come in contact with the pathogen and present virus antigen to the nearby T cells. Both cells can co-stimulate and activate each other. The B cells will then produce antibody against the pathogen. This process I just discussed is shown in number four. Macrophages in the spleen can also pick up the foreign pathogen or antigen presented to the T cells, which activate B cells to produce plasma cells and antibody. When blood-borne pathogens are presented to the spleen, the spleen may become enlarged in response. In the case of mononucleosis, the kissing disease, most frequently seen in teenagers and caused by Epstein-Barr virus or EBV, the spleen may enlarge to become 10 to 16 centimeters long. Splenic rupture is an uncommon but real risk when you have splenomegaly. Since the spleen is no longer under the protection of the ribs, Blunt trauma to the abdomen may cause splenic rupture, which may result in death. This leads to the clinical recommendation to avoid contact sports or any activities that could result in splenic rupture 
when someone has mononucleosis. Previously, there was a blanket prolonged restriction from sports. Luckily, now the ultrasound has allowed specific recommendations based on data. A spleen longer than 12 centimeters is unlikely to be under the protection of the ribs. And a benign evaluation by ultrasound, which just takes a few minutes, can assist with specific recommendations recording regarding sports based on the actual size of the spleen. Now let's talk hematopoiesis. While you are still in utero before you are born, the spleen is making the blood as the bone marrow will in the future. The spleen plays a vital role in erythropoiesis, the process of red blood cell production, particularly in response to stress and inflammation. When the bone marrow's capacity is overwhelmed or when conditions like hypoxia or inflammation trigger the need for increased red cells, the spleen steps in to produce red blood cells a process known as stress erythropoiesis. Erythropoietin, or EPO, a hormone that stimulates red blood cell production, plays a crucial role in this splenic erythropoiesis. Erythropoietin is made, among other places, by the splenic macrophages. What if you don't have a spleen? The spleen may need to be removed in certain hematological disorders and or trauma when it's destroyed. Due to, vaso due to vaso occlusion, patients with sickle cell disease are functionally asplenic by the time they get to kindergarten. Who picks up the slack for the red pulp if the spleen is removed? Well, you may have guessed it. The bone marrow-derived monocytes continue to eat up the senescent red blood cells, but it happens in the bone marrow and the liver. So the old guys go down into the cemetery of the liver or the bone marrow when there's no splenic cemetery. Now let's talk encapsulated organisms. Are there issues with respect to the white pulp if you don't have a spleen? Well, encapsulated organisms have a polysaccharide capsule that helps them to evade the immune system. B cells can make antibodies to this polysaccharide capsule so that it can, the, the bacteria can still be destroyed. Which bacteria have this evasive polysaccharide capsule? Well, Streptococcus pneumonia, which is a common cause of infections even in healthy people, Neisseria gonorrhea or Neisseria meningitis is another one. Staphylococcus aureus, which is ubiquitous and commonly a component of normal skin flora, is another. So there is a high risk of it causing infection, again, even in healthy people. Haemophilus influenza is another. Some E. coli, Klebsiella pneumonia, Salmonella, and bordadella pertussis and anthrax. B cells will opsonize these pathogens, basically by putting little flags all over the surface so other members of the immune system can recognize them as pathogens and wipe them out, despite the fact that they have that sneaky polysaccharide capsule. The spleen houses specialized macrophages that recognize and phagocytose these opsonized bacteria, the ones that are coated in antibodies. So, when these pathogens are in the blood, the specialized macrophages in the spleen will clear them. If a person has had their spleen removed or have a non-functioning spleen, they are at much higher risk for overwhelming infections from these encapsulated organisms. Luckily, we now have vaccines for most of these common organisms. Patients with sickle cell disease that are functionally asplenic and those who have had their spleen removed, most often from trauma, can now be vaccinated and live life without an elevated risk of sepsis. Progress is awesome. All right, 
The spleen is amazing. It does so much. Thank you for learning with me, and I'll see you next time.